In June 1944, the Soviet Union launched Operation Bagration. The attack destroyed Germany's Army Group Center and allowed the Soviets to push to the gates of Warsaw. However, German counterattacks inflicted heavy losses and Soviet logistics were strained to the limit. The offensive was over by August. Following that, a limited Soviet offensive in October failed to penetrate East Prussia. With that defeat and the onset of winter, the Soviets concentrated their forces on taking Budapest. Still, 1944 was a triumph of Soviet arms. Joseph Stalin's intelligence estimates indicated that during 1944, 96 German divisions had been captured or destroyed, and another 33 so weakened that they were disbanded. Following Operation Bagration, Georgi Zhukov returned to Moscow in late September 1944. In October, he planned the next major push, working closely with Alexei Antonov. On the 28th and 29th of October 1944, senior commanders met with Stalin, who reluctantly agreed to stop the drive on East Prussia. The plan was for the 1st Belorussian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front to break out from three bridgeheads over the Vistula River. From there, the Soviets would destroy Army Group A and push to the Oder River and Berlin. The 2nd and 3rd Belorussian Fronts would clear out East Prussia and Silesia. Sukhov delayed attacking in order to build up enough fuel and ammunition to continue a sustained drive and be able to blunt German counterattacks. For the operation, Joseph Stalin made Sukhov's 1st Belorussian Front the most powerful multi-army formation of World War II. It contained well over 1 million troops in 8 combined arms armies and 2 tank armies, including the 1st Polish Army. Sukhov had three of the best Soviet combat leaders under him. Mikhail Katukov was with the 1st Guards Tank Army. Nikolai Semanyak led the 3rd Shock Army and Vasily Chukov commanded the 8th Guards Army. Sukhov came from a family of tradesmen, and despite little education, he could read and write. This ensured him an officer's rank in the Tsarist Army. He joined the Bolsheviks early in 1917 and remained a committed communist to his dying day. He did well in the Russian Civil War, but it was in the interwar period that he gained notice. His rigid discipline, efficiency, and organizational skills made his cavalry unit the best in Russia. He was among the few senior officers to survive Stalin's purge. Stalin favored cavalry officers and distrusted theorists such as Mikhail Chukachevsky and Erdanim Uberovich. This likely saved Zhukov, who was not part of their clique. Zhukov's victory at the Kalkalin Gull brought him to Stalin's attention and assured him a high position in the Soviet military. However, his relationship with Stalin was complicated. Sukhov was mostly pliant and even launched hasty attacks ordered by Stalin, yet he would at times stand up to him, and by 1942 the two had an increasingly strained relationship. Stalin even gathered evidence to use against Sukhov and arrested some of his subordinates. Sukhov did nothing to protect these men. In fact, Sukhov often threatened and fired fellow officers and rarely protected them from Stalin's wrath and even took credit that belonged to others. These traits made him unpopular with his fellow senior commanders, who also thought he meddled too much in operations and hogged resources. In late 1944, Sukhov bickered with Katukov. The Soviets used 800,000 women in the army, and many officers took field wives. Sukhov threatened to send the NKVD to take away Katukov's field wife, even as Sukhov openly cavorted with Lydia Zakharova, a young medical officer. Sukhov was vain, petty, pushy, tough, confident, and completely determined. He was not an innovative tactician, but he was aggressive and good at logistics. As a strategist, he was capable, and his offensives were usually double envelopments. He believed the keys to victory were mass, surprise, and a ruthless commitment to set objectives, regardless of losses. Pyotr Grigorenko, who served on Sukhov's staff at the Kalkalin Goal, described him as a cruel, vengeful person who did not care about any losses we suffered. He lost more men on average than fellow commanders Ivan Konev, Nikolai Vatutin, and Konstantin Rokosovsky. He boasted to Dwight Eisenhower that he once intentionally marched troops through a minefield in order to save time. The first Ukrainian front was handled by Konev. He had eight combined arms armies and two tank armies. 
Konev was a committed communist and aided by his friendship with Clement Voroshilov, who was a Stalin toady. However, he did well in the defense of Moscow and at Kursk at the Corson Pocket. Sergio Beria and Konev had wicked little eyes, a shaven head that looked like a pumpkin, and an expression full of self-conceit. In a military and government that prized ruthlessness, Konev excelled. Rokosovsky commanded the Second Belarusian Front. He was Polish by birth and orphaned by age 14. Forced into the Russian army of Tsar Nicholas II, he did well in the cavalry, but ended up joining the Bolsheviks in 1917. He gained fame in 1920 when he invaded Mongolia and defeated Roman von Ergen Sternberg, who believed he was the reincarnation of Genghis Khan. In the 1930s, Zukov was his subordinate, and the pair had a tense relationship although each recognized the talents of the other. Unlike Sukov, Rokosovsky embraced Tuchikovsky's theory of deep operations. As such, Rosakovsky was arrested in 1937 and refused to sign a false confession. He was tortured, but he blamed the NKVD and not Stalin for his plight. He was released in 1940 and given major assignments and was widely considered one of the Soviet Union's best commanders. However, in 1944, he had a falling out with Sukhov. When he was transferred from command of the 1st Belarusian Front to lead 2nd Belarusian Front, he asked, Why this disgrace? Why am I being moved from the main axis to one of secondary importance? Aiding Rokosovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front was the 3rd Belarusian Front. It was commanded by Ivan Chernyakovsky. He was too young to fight in either World War I or the Russian Civil War. He rose quickly in the ranks and proved to be a skilled tank commander and played a major role in Operation Bagration. Unlike most Soviet generals, he was popular with his men and made tactical innovations, particularly in the use of assault guns. He was also an intellectual who dabbled in military theory and recited romantic poetry. He described Stalin as a living example of the dialectic and declared, It's impossible to understand him. All you can do is to have faith. The Soviet fronts commanded by Sukhov, Konev, Chernyakovsky, and Rokosovsky were a far cry from those of 1941. Sukhov never advocated improvements in tactical training and Soviet doctrine remained flawed, although some improvements had been made to tactics. Yet, since late 1942, the Soviets had become more proficient and Tukhachevsky's theory of deep operations were fully embraced. Weapons had also improved including the new Joseph Stalin heavy tank, the Su-122, and the Su-152 assault gun. The Soviets also fielded far better aircraft than they did in 1941. However, heavy losses had led to a manpower shortage. Soviet divisions were under strength, a matter made worse because Russian generals were often careless about losses. When discussing losses, commanders would often ask, how many matches were burnt? Or... How many pencils were broken? The 3rd Belarusian Front's ranks in particular were filled in with men pressed into service as the Russians swept over Belarusia and Ukraine. Most of Chernyakovsky's soldiers had received little training and lacked equipment. For most, the Vistula Oder offensive would be their first battle. For this reason, the planning was even more detailed, as the Soviet High Command hoped for rapid and relatively bloodless victory. Anticipation was high in the Soviet ranks. On December 26, 1944, the Soviet Ministry of Defense authorized that all army personnel could send parcels back home. It was effectively a license to loot, and one officer ordered his men to get better at grabbing. For many, the coming operation was a chance at revenge for Nazi atrocities during the war. One Russian soldier wrote, We are proud that we have made it to the beast's lair. We will take revenge, revenge for all of our sufferings. Facing the Russians were two German army groups. In East Prussia, there was an army group center with a second and fourth army and a third panzer army. These were led by George Hans Reinhardt. He was a World War I veteran and a pioneer in armored warfare, along with his friend Heinz Guderian. He commanded the 4th Panzer Division during the invasion of Poland 
and a panzer corps in the defeat of France. After that, he was closely involved in planning Operation Sea Lion. In the invasion of Russia, he won one of the war's largest tank battles at Rossini and reached the outskirts of Leningrad. Although a great tank tactician, Reinhardt's command was particularly ruthless and committed numerous war crimes. Army Group A had 9th and 17th Army, and the 1st and 4th Panzer Army, and the 1st Hungarian Army. These were led by Joseph Harp. He was a Prussian who fought in World War I like Reinhardt. He was a pioneer in tank warfare, and in 1931 studied at the secret German-Russian Kama Tank School in Kazan. He spent 1940 training armored units before leading them on the Eastern Front. He was a favorite of Walter Modell and played a key role in stemming the Soviet advance after Operation Bagration. Guderian, chief of staff of OKH, oversaw German operations on the Eastern Front. Guderian was Prussian, and while not a noble, his family were landowners. In World War I, he was an excellent staff officer and a communications expert, seeing action at Verdun. Like Harp and Reinhardt, he was a pioneer in tank warfare, and his greatest contribution was ensuring that German tanks had radios. His theories were widely read, and he put them into practice in Poland, France, and the Soviet Union. Although a brilliant commander, he was arrogant, short-tempered, and often stole credit. After bickering with Gunther von Kluge and ignoring a steadfast order from Adolf Hitler, he was removed from command on December 26, 1941. Guderian was named Chief of Staff after the bomb plot. For Hitler, it was a compromise of sorts. Guderian was a brilliant staff officer, loyal to the regime, and he had condemned the plotters right away. However, Guderian was known for speaking his mind, even to Hitler himself, and therefore he would not be a toady such as Alfred Jodl, the Chief of Staff of OKW. In preparation for the Russian offensive, Guderian ordered the digging of a series of fortified positions on and behind the Vistula River. Thousands of civilians, both German and Polish, as well as prisoners of war, went to work digging trenches, and they're felling trees for roadblocks and fortifying towns and cities. To man these defensive lines, Guderian knew Harp needed men. To get these, Guderian hoped to have divisions transfer from the west to the east. In addition, the Germans had 20 divisions in the Courland pocket, and Guderian wanted some of them brought over. Hitler, though, wanted the position held to keep the Baltic Sea secured. While Stalin dubbed the Courland troops a prestige garrison, he was forced to keep significant forces in the area. Hitler gambled his reserves on an attack in the Ardennes Forest, dubbed the Wacht am Rhein. The operation was intended to deal a killing blow to the Western Allies. When that failed, Hitler and Jodl planned to use Germany's dwindling reserves to attack near Strasbourg and dubbed it Operation Nordwind. On December 24th, Guderian went to Hitler's command center near Zeigenberg, which was dubbed Adelhorst or the Eagle's Eyrie. He tried to get Hitler to shift forces east and made clear the Soviets had a 3 to 1 superiority. Hitler shot back, It's the greatest imposture since Genghis Khan, who was responsible for producing all of this rubbish. Yodel then used the opportunity to urge Hitler to carry out Nordwin. Neither Hitler nor Yodel thought the Soviets would strike in January. Heinrich Himmler, the ruthless head of the SS, told Guderian, I don't really believe that the Russians will attack at all. It's all an enormous bluff. Guderian later wrote, All of this was of no avail. I was rebuffed and spent a grim and tragic Christmas Eve in those unchristian surroundings. The news of Budapest's encirclement, which reached us that evening, did not tend to raise anyone's spirits. I was dismissed with instructions that the Eastern Front must take care of itself. With Budapest surrounded, Hitler authorized Operation Conrad transferring 3rd and 5th SS Panzer Divisions away from Harp's command. This played right into Soviet plans, since Sukhov hoped that the Budapest Drive would achieve exactly that. Guderian approved the offensive, but still worked to get more men to Harp. On January 1st, he got Gerd von Rundstedt and Albert Kesselring, the commanders in West Germany and Italy respectively, to release forces for a transfer east. Having secured four divisions, Guderian met with Harp on January 6th. In the meeting, Wolfdreich Ritter von Zeilander, Harp's brilliant chief of staff, proposed Operation Sleigh Ride. Zeilander hoped that once the Soviet offensive appeared imminent, 
the Germans would retreat to a backup line. The Soviet bombardment would hit nothing, and once they advanced, the Germans would be in position to counterattack. Reinhardt had a similar retreat in mind, this time to the border of East Prussia. Guderian brought the plan to Hitler's attention, but he thought it was just another retreat, and by now he had a poisoned relationship with Guderian. He also called Reinhard Galen's estimate of Soviet strength completely idiotic. Guderian defended Galen, shouting, If you think he belongs in a madhouse, then lock me up too. Hitler tried to smooth things over at one point, telling him, The Eastern Front has never before possessed such a strong reserve as now. That is your doing, and I thank you for it. Guderian replied, The Eastern Front is like a pack of cards. If the front is broken through at one point, all the rest will collapse, for twelve and a half divisions are far too small a reserve for such an extended front. Hitler ended the argument by telling Guderian, the Eastern Front must help itself and do with what it's got. After Guderian left Hitler, he told one officer, I looked at the numbers today, and we have 3,000 tanks and assault guns in the East. Since we usually shoot up enemy tanks at a 3 to 1 ratio, the Soviets need 9,000 tanks to destroy us. They need a 3 to 1 superiority. But they don't have 9,000 tanks. Not at the moment. And here, if we look at the whole front, they're supposed to have 150 guns every kilometer. That's 1,500 guns on a 10 kilometer front. There is no way that can be true. That would mean 15,000 guns on a 100 kilometer front and 20,000 guns on a 150 kilometer front. The Russians aren't made of artillery. In fact, they were made of artillery. Konev and Zhukov had no fewer than 33,000 guns, 7,000 tanks, and 4,700 aircraft. The two fronts contained 134 rifle divisions, about one-third of all infantry divisions on the entire front, and almost one-half of all the tanks. By contrast, Army Group A had 40,000 men and 1,300 panzers in 12 panzer divisions. Fuel was short and many units had ammunition for only three days of high intensity combat. The ratio against the Germans was five to one in tanks, seven to one in artillery, and 17 to one in aircraft. The Soviets were able to place 220 to 250 guns per kilometer of front. Even Galen's dire estimates of Soviet strength was off. He placed them as having a three to one superiority in infantry instead of a five to one. Reinhardt had 580,000 men but fewer panzers than Harp with 700. Facing Reinhardt, Chernyakovsky and Rokosovsky had over 1.5 million men and around 3,000 tanks. The second Belarusian front had seven field armies, Fifth Guards Tank Army, and several mobile corps. Chernyakovsky had the smallest force with six combined arms armies and two tank corps. Making matters worse, the German Army of 1945 was in bad shape. Units were often under strength and poorly armed. Training standards had been reduced in 1943. The fighting in 1944 had seen most veterans becoming casualties. Recruitment standards dropped too. As men older and younger were allowed in, some with serious medical issues. Even the Waffen SS saw a sharp drop in quality. Germany's only advantage was their tanks were superior and their tactical doctrine was better than their Soviet adversaries. Harp was hopeful about Hitler accepting his plan until Zylander told him, the Fuhrer has rejected everything, Curlin, reinforcements from the West, and sleigh ride. The front line stays where it is and the situation remains the same. The Fuhrer does not believe that the Russians will attack. Some of it was because an attack was expected on December 20th when that did not occur, the next estimate by Harp's staff was January 16th. They were correct, but Stalin decided to move up the attack date. Instead of striking on January 16th, the assault would come on January 12th. Stalin later said it was to aid the Western Allies. While they were under pressure, they never directly asked Stalin for aid, and Stalin himself called Wacht am Rhein stupid. In reality, Stalin wanted to look like he was helping, while also showing Sukhov and the generals that he was in charge. However, some units were not ready on January 12th, so the offensive developed in a very staggered pattern. The 
the final plan was for the first BLR Russian front and the first Ukrainian front to punch through the lines and drive on Berlin. Konev could not hope to conceal the site of his attack, but had 400 dummy tanks placed behind 60th Army. A full network of fake supply routes intended to make Harp think he was going to strike towards Krakow. Second and fourth Ukrainian front would clear out the Carpathian Mountains to the south. Third Belarusian front, aided by elements of the first Baltic front, would invade East Prussia. Second Belarusian front would push to the Oder River and then turn north, cutting off the Germans in Pomerania and East Prussia and flushing out those forces. In previous years, Stalin had relied on Stavka coordinators such as Zhukov to oversee multiple fronts. Now there would be no coordinator. Stalin was nominally in charge of every front from the Baltic to the Adriatic Sea. Stalin hoped to enhance his post-war prestige as the man who oversaw final victory. On January 12th, Konev's first Ukrainian front attacked. Konev struck from a long stretch of the Vistula between Baranau and Sandomers. Konev planned on a single massive thrust with five armies and nearly half his force. 3rd Guards Tank Army and 4th Guards Tank Army were also poised to strike on day one. Historian Robert Sitno had once called Konev's assault the single greatest concentration of land power in all of World War II. Konev's attack on 4th Panzer Army opened at 4.45 a.m. with a furious 15-minute barrage, with some 300 guns per kilometer arranged literally hub to hub. Just after it ended, four battalions overran the front line and reaching the second trench and destroying strong points. The Germans, though, had detected the attack and sought shelter just in time. A second heavier barrage of some 107 minutes was ordered. Dmitry Lelyushenko, commander of the 4th Guards Tank Army, wrote, The recent silence gave way to a general thundering, booming, crackling, and whistling. Shells and mortar bombs fell on the area tens of kilometers wide and deep. From where those arose, plumes of smoke, fire, and dust compounded with snow. The ground quivered, and the very earth of the battlefield was blackened. After this barrage, the German infantry now believed the main attack was on, and they emerged from their bunkers. Konev anticipated this and ordered another 15-minute barrage that caught the Germans in the open. This was followed by a rolling barrage that hit German reserves. The headquarters of 4th Panzer Army was destroyed. Fritz Hubert Grosser, commander of the 4th Panzer Army, survived, but was dazed and unable to command. The Germans lost about two-thirds of their artillery and one-quarter of their personnel in the second barrage. The Soviets then saw a rare sight in World War II. The Germans panicked and ran en masse from their positions. By the afternoon, three German infantry divisions had ceased to exist. In addition, due to his suspicions about Harp wanting to retreat, Hitler had placed his panzer reserves too far forward. As such, they took a beating from Soviet artillery before they had even fired a shot. In the chaos, Walter Nehring, commander of the 24th Panzer Corps, lost contact with 16th and 17th Panzer Divisions. Nehring was one of the pioneers in tank warfare. He was acclaimed as a brilliant staff officer and planner. He commanded 18th Panzer Division on the Eastern Front in 1941 and later the Africa Corps under Erwin Rommel. Although a superb tank commander, Nehring faced an impossible situation. Both 16th and especially 17th Panzer Division were significantly under strength. By noon, the German lines had ruptured, and at 2 o'clock p.m., Konev sent in 2,000 tanks, many painted with slogans such as, Forward into the fascist lair, and Revenge and death to the German occupiers. Nehring, meanwhile, regained contact with his divisions, and was ordered to Kelsey, only to find the Soviets just rushing in. Nehring's panzers made disjointed attacks and were absolutely shredded. In addition, 4th Guards Tank Army was the best outfit of its kind in the Red Army, and its crews were well-trained in marksmanship. In the fighting, Albert Brooks, commander of the 17th Panzer Division, was wounded and taken prisoner. By nightfall, Konev had torn a 25-mile-wide gash and pushed 20 miles into the German rear. Nehring's most powerful formation was the 424th Heavy Tank Battalion, armed with 52 Tiger I and Tiger II tanks. On January 13th, the battalion plunged ahead to aid 17th Panzer Division. Some tanks sank in the soft soil since the Tiger II was very heavy. 
After initial success, the battalion was ambushed at Lisau by Joseph Stalin tanks and anti-tank guns. The battalion was shredded, and the next day many tanks had to be abandoned due to a lack of fuel. The defeat of the 424th Heavy Tank Battalion eliminated whatever slim chance Nering had of delaying Konev. 4th Panzer Army had been annihilated in only two days, and Konev plunged west. By January 18th, what was left of 16th and 17th Panzer Divisions were surrounded at Kelsey. By now, Konev was five days ahead of schedule. While Konev was destroying 4th Panzer Army, 2nd and 4th Ukrainian Front attacked into the Carpathian Mountains. The terrain was difficult, but on January 15th, 38th Army broke through the German 17th Army. By January 18th, German and Hungarian forces were sent reeling, thereby securing Konev's southern flank. On January 13th, Chernyakovsky, supported by 1st Baltic Front, attacked. Erhard Raus, commander of the 3rd Panzer Army, had deduced when the Soviets would strike and withdrew his men from their forward positions. Progress was slow. The men crossing the border at East Prussia with signs reading, Soldier, remember you are now entering the lair of the fascist beast. Reinhardt launched several effective counterattacks that slowed Russian progress. Inexperienced Soviet troops did poorly. Some units panicked and were forced back to the front only at gunpoint. The Soviets then confronted substantial fortifications in the Insterberg Gap east of Konigsberg and around Heilsberg. Reinhardt's men were fighting on German soil and were determined to hold. Guy Mamanu of the Panzer Grenadier Division Graudeutschland recalled the battle cry was, No Bolshevik will ever tread on German soil. But he thought they were there by the thousands, crushing it with frenzy and jubilation. In over six days, the Soviets advanced only 13 miles, but eventually the 3rd Panzer Army was forced into Konigsberg. To the north of Warsaw, Rokossovsky struck Reinhardt's 4th Army on January 14th. He held three bridgeheads over the Naru River and two around Pulsk, and a third at Lamza. Rokossovsky did not like the plan as he felt detached from the 1st and 3rd Belorussians. Against fierce resistance, Rokossovsky's progress was disappointing. The Germans had warning of Rokossovsky's bombardment and had pulled back. The 507th Heavy Tank Battalion with 51 Tiger Ones and Tiger Twos was well deployed and not too far forward. Most tanks were in small groups allowing them to aid various positions. Both the Grop Deutschland Division and the 7th Panzer Division made counterattacks, with the 7th Panzer Division taking heavy losses. Reinhardt was holding on, but it was clear the Soviets would eventually break through. He asked Hitler if he could withdraw. Hitler refused. The same day, Rokossovsky struck. Sukhov delivered the killing blow. The 1st Belorussian Front had two bridgeheads over the Vistula, at Magnazu and Pulawi. Sukhov crafted a complicated plan with three pincers meant to encircle and destroy German forces before driving west. Opposing them was the 9th Army, led by Smilo Freiherr von Lutwitz. He was a Prussian of high standing and known for leading from the front, he opposed Hitler's more murderous policies, a stand that later allowed him to command major forces in the West German army. He had kept 9th Army on high alert and his forces were considered some of the best on the Eastern Front. In reserve, he had 19th and 25th Panzer Divisions. The 25th Panzer Division was in relatively good condition, while the 19th Panzer Division had done well in 1944 and was considered to be among the best. In a 25-minute barrage, the Soviets fired 315,000 rounds. Sukhov massed over 1,000 Katusha rocket launchers, which poured more ordnance much faster than conventional artillery. In Chukov's Magnazu sector, Sukhov crowded in half his rifle divisions and 70% of all artillery and tanks, creating a numerical superiority of 10 to 1. Here, the barrage annihilated two German infantry divisions, and Sukhov's pioneer battalion cleared out the minefields a rare tactical innovation for Sukhov. Katukov recalled that in the fighting, Chukov was hurling short phrases down the telephone. Though I could not distinguish what he was saying on account of all the din, outside a scattering of infantry showed black against the white landscape. Otherwise, Chukov could scarcely bear to put down his binoculars, for he knew that his most decisive minutes were approaching. 
Chukov's 8th Guards Army, supported by 5th Shock Army and the 61st Army, opened a clean breach as the Germans fell back from their first and second line of defense. Indeed, so rapid was the success, a second barrage was called off and a heavy bridge over the Politza River was taken before the German engineers could detonate their charges. Meanwhile, to the south at the Pulawi, Sukov attacked with 33rd and 69th Army. Here, the Russians concentrate artillery fire to literally blast holes in the German lines. By the end of the day, Sukov had driven 20 miles. 33rd and 69th Army were well on their way to Radom. On January 15th, Lutwitz counterattacked. But with his lines breached in two areas, he split his divisions, directing 19th Panzer towards Pulawi and the 25th against Magnazu. Meanwhile, Katukov received from Sukov a simple message, get the ball rolling. While he plunged his Soviet tanks ahead, Sukov's aircraft and anti-tank guns wrecked the Panzers. That same day, Sukov directed the 47th Army to begin its envelopment of Warsaw from the north. While 61st Army and 1st Polish Army drove up from the south, Sukov also committed the 2nd Guards Tank Army. By the end of January 15th, Sukov had made a clean breach of the German defenses. German Army Group A ceased to exist. The next day, Rokosovsky committed the 5th Guards Tank Army, which overran 7th Panzer Division. In the days ahead, the once mighty 507th Heavy Panzer Battalion had to abandon nearly all of its tanks. The German garrison at Warsaw was small and included one unit dubbed the Ear Battalion because it was made up of men who had suffered hearing damage but were forced to the front. Harp asked Bogoslaw von Bonin, the head of the operations department, if he could retreat. Guderian approved the withdrawal from Warsaw. When Hitler found out, he screamed, You must stop everything! Fortress Warsaw must be held! It was too late. Warsaw fell to the Soviets on January 17th, with the first Polish army parading through the streets. In reaction, Hitler ordered that every instruction sent to an army group had to first be approved. By now, the Soviets were pushing west at a rapid pace. Konev managed to surprise the Germans in Krakow and take the city without a serious fight. Sukov sometimes issued orders for objectives which had already been seized, yet the rapid advance meant many Germans remained in the rear. These parties, sometimes 200 strong, moved west, ambushing Russians where they could, often just to get food. The 19th and 25th Panzer Divisions managed to escape and pulled off a fighting retreat to Lodz. Nering organized the largest such group, some 10,000 strong in what Germans called a wandering cauldron. Dubbed Group Nering, they moved off-road by night in the gap between Sukhov and Konev's forces. After 10 days of fighting, Nering's men reached the Oder River at Glogau, after having traveled 200 miles. It was an impressive achievement in the midst of disaster. Guderian wrote, the catastrophe at the front was coming down on us like an avalanche. On January 15th, Hitler ordered men to Poland. Hans Ulrich Rudel's elite fighters, made up of Stuka bombers, were called up from Budapest. Rudel was Germany's finest Stuka pilot and leader. He was also a committed Nazi who drove his men hard. More importantly, some 40 divisions were transferred, including the elite Gross Deutschland Panzer Corps came down from East Prussia. Guderian saw it as a waste since it weakened East Prussia and was too little too late. The Corps was ordered to Lodz, its lead units arriving on January 16th. The first to arrive was the elite Hermann Goering Panzer Division. They, along with the 19th and 25th Panzer Divisions and the Brandenburg Panzer Grenadier Division, confronted the 8th Guards Army. They may have held Lodz longer, but trains of reinforcements were destroyed by 2nd Guards Tank Army. Lodz fell on the evening of January 19th. By now, the German high command was in crisis. On January 16th, Hitler transferred his headquarters to Berlin. By now, Hitler and Guderian were constantly arguing, mostly over the decision to move the Gross Deutschland Corps. Hitler's plan to send 6th Panzer Army to Hungary and the fall of Warsaw. 
In a fit of spite, Hitler had Bonin and other members of Guderian's staff arrested and interrogated by the Gestapo. Guderian insisted that he too should be interrogated, and Hitler granted him his wish. For hours, Guderian was questioned by Ernst Kaltenbrunner of the Reich Security Head Office and Heinrich Miller, the chief of the Gestapo. While the other two officers were released after two weeks, Bonin remained in concentration camp until the war's end. On January 20th, Stalin and his staff decided that Chernyakovsky needed immediate help. Rokossovsky was ordered to swing north toward Elbing on the Baltic Sea, the intent being to seal off Army Group Center. This movement caught Reinhardt by surprise. Allenstein fell on January 22nd, threatening the rear of Friedrich Hosbach's 4th Army. On January 23rd, 5th Guards Tank Army Spearhead entered Elbing, having been mistaken for German panzers. They were driven out. In response, Rokossovsky bypassed the city and reached the Vistula Lagoon on January 24th, cutting off most of Army Group Center. In desperation, Hosbach abandoned the fortified city of Lotzen. On January 26, Reinhardt launched an attack and meant to at least provide civilians an escape route. They took 48th Army by surprise and almost reached Elbing. However, Rokossovsky reacted swiftly and by January 29th, the offensive was over. Army Group Center was again surrounded and trapped, with them over 600,000 civilians. In the midst of disaster, Hitler fired his commanders. Harp and Ludwitz were blamed for losing Warsaw without a fight. When Lotzen fell, Reinhardt and Hosbach were sacked for retreating. Upon hearing the news, Reinhardt quipped, There is nothing more to say. The new commanders were chosen for their loyalty, compliance, and brutality. Lothar Rendelik was given the Army Group's center. Rendelik first gained notoriety for his bitter defense of the Orel Salient in 1943. He was utterly ruthless. In Yugoslavia, he murdered thousands and burned Lapland in 1944 when he oversaw the retreat of the 20th Mountain Army. He was among Hitler's favorites and had joined the Austrian Nazi party in 1932. Ferdinand Scharner was given Army Group A. His personal motto was strength through fear, and he was beloved by Hitler and Goebbels. While men such as Guderian liked aspects of Nazism, Scherner was a complete believer who rarely questioned Hitler. He notoriously flew his Feisler Stork aircraft around the rear areas, looking to bring men to the front. Schorner once told his chief of staff, You handle the operations, I'll keep order. After the attempt on Hitler's life, he opened staff meetings by asking, How many men did you hang today? Those hanged were put on the side of the road, often with the placard, I am a deserter, and was too cowardly to protect German women and children. These methods had mixed results. Scharner was a canny defensive fighter and able to form emergency units. One of Scharner's first acts was to replace Ludwitz with Theodor Buss. He was infamous for allowing the Corson pocket to form back in 1944. He never disobeyed Hitler. Friedrich Wilhelm Müller replaced Hosbach. Whereas Hosbach was independent-minded and critical of Nazism, Miller was a cruel fanatic who murdered hundreds of Greeks, earning the nickname the Butcher of Crete. Müller, Renderich, and Scherner were monsters, but none of them could compete with Himmler. In this desperate hour, Hitler ordered Himmler to organize Army Group Vistula, which would defend Berlin. Himmler was a bureaucratic fighter without equal. Even one officer who liked serving under Himmler told Rudel, only one thing will strike you. You will always have the feeling that Himmler never says what he really thinks. He created the SS and made it into the most powerful and feared force in Europe, overseeing the murder of millions. Himmler now wanted military glory, which had eluded him in Operation Sonnenwende. His own offensive meant to aid Operation Nordwind. Himmler had few troops and had poor staff but his connections allowed him to scrape together units, including large numbers of Volkstrom, which were old men and teenagers forced into service. He also set about organizing the 11th SS Panzer Army. Meanwhile, Himmler made overheated declarations. He ordered, death and punishment for failure to carry out one's duty, but also added, after hard trials lasting several weeks, the day will come when German territories will be free again. In his orders, women were forbidden to even give food to retreating troops. In another official declaration, he said, 
The Lord God has never forsaken our people, and he has always helped the brave in the hour of their greatest need. Guderian, meanwhile, tried to get Maximilian von Weichs, the commander of the army group Vistula, but to no avail. While the German commanders were shuffled, Konev and Zukov pressed on. Stalin wanted the mines and factories of Upper Silesia captured intact. As such, Konev surrounded them, but left 17th Army in escape route. Schorner received permission to withdraw, and 17th Army fled west. By January 29th, the area was in Soviet hands and in good condition. With the fall of the factories, German industry and logistics completely collapsed. The next goal was the Oder River, where the remnants of 9th Army and 4th Panzer Army took up position on January 29th. Shortly after chasing off 17th Army, the 1st Ukrainian Front established bridgeheads over the Oder River. Not to be outdone, Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front raced ahead, bypassing German pockets. On January 25th, Stalin told Zhukov to wait once he reached the Oder River, as Rokossovsky was now engaged in each Prussia. Sukov insisted he keep pushing, and Stalin agreed. At Poznan, 45 to 60,000 Germans were surrounded by Chukov. In one incident, a shocked Himmler ordered elements of the 103rd Heavy SS Panzer Battalion to restore the situation. Himmler's staff protested, but they went in piecemeal, some of the tanks detraining and going straight into combat, only to be defeated. On January 31st, 5th Shock Army secured a small bridgehead at Kainitz, only 44 miles from Berlin. A bridgehead was also taken at Kustrin. Weeks before, a popular Christmas joke in Berlin was, be practical, give a coffin. Those words were even more true as January turned into February. Sukov, egged on by Chukov, planned to strike at Berlin on February 15th. However, a sudden thaw melted the snow. Significant German forces also held the cities of Thorn, Scheinmull, Deutschkron and Arnswald, all well in Sukhov's rear. Konev still had to deal with Breslau, one of the most fortified cities in the Third Reich. Soviet aircraft was too far to the rear with few working airfields. The Luftwaffe had its last great moment and attacked the Russians freely. Rudel's wing struck constantly, ignoring the weather even as aircraft losses piled up. Rudel later wrote, We are involved in a crusade. We have become very taciturn between sorties and in the evenings. Everyone carries out his duty in typed lip silence, ready if need be to lay down his life. Meanwhile, the fighting at Poznan still raged on. Chukov did not relish taking the city, and his dislike for Sukov increased. In reference Sukov's poor intelligence work, he told his staff, It really is amazing when you consider our battle experience and our wonderful intelligence that we failed to notice one little detail. We didn't know that there is a first-class fortress at Poznan, one of the strongest in Europe. We thought it was just a town which we could take off them on the march, but now we're really in for it. Poznan would hold out until February 23rd. The confusion in Himmler's command also confused the Soviets. Himmler's constant and poor use of wireless communications convinced some that Army Group Vistula was stronger than it was. In addition, the Germans launched Operation Solstice. The attack only succeeded in saving the Arnswald garrison, but it angered Stalin and caused the Soviets to become cautious. Almost every Soviet soldier remembered the moment of crossing Germany's pre-1939 frontier. Signs were posted, one that read, Here it is, the accursed Germany. One Soviet poster read, Red Army soldier, you are now on German soil. The hour of revenge has struck. Upon entering East Prussia, Lev Kopolev, a Soviet officer and an ardent communist, told his men, This is Germany. Everyone out and relieve yourselves. Before the offensive, Rokossovsky issued order number six in an attempt to curb looting, violence, robbery, unnecessary arson, and destruction. However, Rokossovsky's officers feared the wrath of the men if they tried to enforce it, while some officers complained to Stalin that Rokossovsky was going soft. 
In this mood, the troops, particularly in the rear, drank, looted, murdered, tortured, and ravished their way across Poland and Germany. Of all the atrocities committed, mass rape became the most notorious. Zakhar Agronenko, serving in the Second Belarusian Front, observed, Red Army soldiers don't believe in individual liaisons with German women. Nine, ten, twelve men at a time. They rape them on a collective basis. One soldier wrote in February 1945, They do not speak a word of Russian, but that makes it easier. You don't have to persuade them. You just point a noggin and tell them to lie down. Then you do your stuff and go away. Mass rapes occurred with some officers making sure every soldier in their command had a turn. By the time Elbing fell, the German women offered themselves to Soviet infantry hoping to gain a personal protector. Mass executions also occurred, but how many died is hard to ascertain. Towns were burned, officials murdered, and columns of refugees were strafed and shelled as they fled west toward Berlin. Whole villages were razed even at the hint that they harbored partisans, German or Polish. In one gruesome incident, a group of German women were raped and then mutilated with empty wine bottles stuck into their vaginas. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, made good use of these stories and published them, including Soviet letters home. In one missive, the words were blunt enough. Happy is the heart as you drive through a burning German town. We are taking revenge for everything, and our revenge is just. Fire for fire, blood for blood, death for death. While Germans were general targets, the SS, already feared and hated, were granted no quarter. In one account, an SS soldier was forced to play a piano, it being clear who would be shot if he stopped. He managed to play for 16 hours before he collapsed and sobbed on the keyboard. The Russians then dragged him out and shot him. In the orgy of destruction, Poles, German communists, and even Russians were targets. Stalin claimed Soviet soldiers were being killed by anti-communist Poles. The partisans were labeled as fascists, and it was used as an excuse to wipe out Polish resistance fighters. Before 1933, many Germans were openly communist. These credentials did little to save such people. The Soviets instead asked questions such as, Why are you not with the partisans? And why did the German working class not fight Hitler? At Poznan, hundreds of Russian women, forced into sex slavery by the Germans, were in turn assaulted by their liberators. The reasons for Soviet atrocities were many. Some of it was simple revenge for German brutality in the East. An official slogan was, The soldier's rage in battle must be terrible. He does not merely seek to fight. He must also be the embodiment of the court of his people's justice. The soldiers also confronted the horrors of the Nazi regime. The blasted remains of Warsaw moved all but the hardest heart. Out of a pre-war population of 1,310,000 people, there were only 162,000 in January 1945. The Germans had destroyed nearly every historic monument. Captain Klochkov of the 3rd Shock Army wrote, Nothing was left but ruins and ashes covered by snow. Badly starved and exhausted residents were making their way home. The Polish soldiers were such in no mood for mercy. They literally shot prisoners, causing Russian generals to complain. In one incident, the 1st Polish Division captured 80 Germans, 78 were dead before they reached headquarters. Before they could be properly questioned, the remaining two were killed. Elsewhere, the Soviets, particularly Konev's men, found the evidence of the Holocaust. Back in July 1944, the Soviets came upon the Majdanek concentration camp at Lublin, but it did not cause a great stir. As the front collapsed, thousands in the camps were shuttled west, dying in mass. On January 27th, the 107th Rifle Division took Auschwitz before it could be destroyed. They discovered that the first gas chamber was tested on Russian and Polish prisoners of war, although the Soviets did not thoroughly publish what they found until May 8, 1945. News spread throughout the army. Most of the anger was directed at the murder of Russian prisoners, as the average Soviet soldier was quite anti-Semitic. Making it all worse was that the American, British, and French prisoners of war were well treated by the Germans. One officer reported that Western Allied prisoners found near Thorn looked more like people on holiday than prisoners of war while Soviet prisoners were emaciated and wrapped in blankets. There were other reasons for the explosion in brutality. Many were angered by the relative plenty they saw in Germany, wondering why such people would ever want war. Many were appalled by German culture. One soldier declared, 
Europe is a dirty abyss. I have taken a look at German magazines and they revolt me. Even their music is indecent. Is this Europe? Give me Siberia anytime. When one soldier found a cache of pornographic pictures near Konigsberg, he declared, What could be more disgusting? Our culture must be higher than that of the Germans, because you would never find such things among our ranks. Also, before 1945, Soviet soldiers were punished for rape and sexually transmitted diseases, while German units sometimes had field brothels and sex slaves, and all soldiers were issued condoms. Soviet infantry had none of this. Gabriel Temkin recalled that one unit found condoms and did not know what they were, so they blew them up like balloons and just played with them. The brutality of Stalin's regime did not make men tender-hearted, and here the brutality was state-sanctioned and encouraged. Ilya Ehrenberg, a Soviet propaganda author, wrote the official line, Germany, you can whirl round in circles and howl in your deathly agony. The hour of revenge has struck. Stalin also wanted East Prussia ethnically cleansed of Germans and welcomed the destruction that was wrought. He bragged to Winston Churchill about the huge waves of German refugees running away from the Red Army. In addition, Stalin intended to strip German industry as reparations for the damage caused. In the NKVD, special safe-cracking units were formed. It was only in April 1945 when Stalin himself ordered that reprisals be halted. By then, Stalin was looking at to cultivating German communists, and it was clear the rape and looting had hurt morale and combat effectiveness, not to mention giving the Germans a renewed purpose to fight. To restore order in April 1945, Konev had several officers and men shot. The soldiers were angry, and many muttered, some commanders, they'll shoot their own men over a German bitch. The Germans were terrified of the Soviets long before they reached the Reich. Many knew of German atrocities in the East as well as the brutal methods Stalin employed. In this mood, Nazi leaders exhorted the people to even greater and more pointless sacrifice. On January 12th, Arthur Greiser, a particularly brutal Nazi, extolled, The Bolshevist flood would bleed itself to death on the borders. Not until January 20th did Greiser approve an evacuation of Warthgau. As the people fled into the cold, Greiser boarded a train and went west. The scenes of flight became fevered as news of rape and murder came to every German's ear. For many, there was a renewed purpose to fight. Rudell later recalled, It is a dreadful thing to be flying and fighting above our homes. The more so when one sees what masses of men and material are pouring into our country, like a flood. If we are no more than a boulder, a small obstruction but unable to stem the tide, the devil is now gambling for Germany, for all Europe. Invaluable forces are bleeding to death. The last bastion of the world is crumbling under the assault of Red Asia. Germany would, at least in the East, fight to the death in the coming months. The Vistula Oder Offensive was the best planned and executed Soviet offensive of the war. Soviet losses in Konev and Sukhov's command did not exceed 200,000, and those were mostly among Konev's ranks. Sukhov alone covered 310 miles in three weeks. German losses were at least 400,000. The 25th Panzer Division was one of the few units to escape the disaster, and it still lost nearly all of its tanks and around 8,000 men. Germany had already lost World War II, but in the swift destruction in January 1945 ensured it would happen sooner than most thought possible. It also came with an orgy of violence while refugees ran for safety. Guy Mamanu observed, the entire Prussian civilian population was fleeing towards the coast in a tragic tide. Areas that had been German for centuries were vacated. By February 19th, it was estimated 8.35 million had fled. At the end of January, between 40,000 and 50,000 refugees were arriving in Berlin each day. Eastern Europe would never be the same. On January 30th, far away from the front, three German commanders spoke of their nation's fate. They were Friedrich Paulus, Karl Strecker, and Walter von Seidlitz. These were the men who had surrendered at Stalingrad, Germany's first catastrophic defeat in the war. Paulus and Seidlitz had supported the anti-Nazi League of German officers, but now they were gloomy. Each realized that Germany was about to be ripped apart. Paulus concluded, All Hitler thinks about is how to force the German people into new sacrifices. 
Never before in history has lying been such a powerful weapon in diplomacy and policy. We Germans have been cunningly deceived by a man who usurped power. Strecker replied, Why has God become so angry with Germany that he sent us Hitler? Are the German people so ignoble? Have they deserved such a punishment? Paulus then observed, It is two years since the Stalingrad catastrophe, and now the whole of Germany is becoming a gigantic Stalingrad. <laughs>